Father, thank you again for this day, this beautiful day. I pray that you would give us open hearts, minds, ears to hear what uh, you have to say from your word. I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but uh, doers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, um, with the title, Teach Your Children Well, that's a big, expansive title. And you might be wondering how I'm going to run with it. Um, are, are you going to talk about what kind of curriculum, uh, you know, how I should choose curriculum? Um, I may touch on that, but it's going to be real broad brush strokes when I do, and it'll be short. The main thrust of this talk is not what to teach your children. You probably already kind of know what you're going to teach your children. You kind of got the subjects that you're supposed to teach, science, math, whatever. And you may have already uh, chosen your curriculum. So I'm not going to meddle too much in that. But I am going to talk about how we teach our children. From a biblical perspective, you could say it's biblical or uh, uh, principles of Christian pedagogy. I don't know if you've heard that word pedagogy. That comes from the Greek word padaia, which uh, means to, well, we see the Greek word in that uh, Ephesians passage of uh, raise up your children the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nurture and admonition is uh, the English translation of paideia, which is much more than just cramming stuff into your head. Uh, it's enculturation. And so, that's what I'm going to hit on. This is going to be more like a sermon. Okay? More like a sermon on how to teach your children well. How? Well, let's open to Deuteronomy uh, 6, 1 through 9. I'll read it, and then we'll unpack it a bit. Now, this is... How long do I have? From... Okay. It's great. Because sometimes when you start late, that's fine, but then it's, as long as I don't get my talk shaped up. <laughs> um, now, this is the commandment that the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them, on, bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So, What I want to do now is unpack this, see how God wanted the Israelites to be taught. Okay? If, and this is the law of God, it's not talking about science or math or chemistry. It's talking about the law of God. But if we can find out from Scripture how the law of God is to be taught, it might do us well to take some of those principles and apply them to how we teach everything else that we think is important. But remember this, the law of God is the main curriculum. Okay? Have, you know, uh, I forget who said it, you, you want yourself to be marinating in Scripture so that when you get cut, you bleed Bible. You want it to just be in you. Not just in your head, in your heart. Everything is enculturated. Not with Bible knowledge, 
but with it, as my brother says, it should flow out your fingertips. It should be part of your life. And that's how we kind of want our kids to be in all these other subjects. We don't want it to just be in their head. We want it to be in their life. Okay, so let's look at how we should teach the law of God. Okay, let's look at the duration. In verse 2, it says that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all the statutes and commandments, which I command you all the days of your life. So that's number one. Education, we often just kind of say, okay, we're going to do this unit, for, and that's been there, done that. Next unit, been there, done that. Next unit, been there, done that. And that's it. But here, the law of God is for your whole life should be, it should be repetitive. You don't just paint your house once. Hopefully it's not every year. Hopefully it's once every 10 or 15 years, but it needs to go on. You need to do more than one coat and you need to do it again after all the paint starts to chip off. And we need to, and, and sometimes kids disdain that repetitive, you know, oh, we've done this. We've learned this before. Well, we're going to learn it again. And again. And again. And again. We need repetition. The, that's, when you look at the Old Testament, God was saying, teach it to your children. And, and they should teach it to their children. It should be repetitive. And you should hear it over and over. You don't read your Bible once. You read it over and over again. Okay? So it's lifelong. Also, we see in verse 7 how we should teach it. We should teach it diligently at every opportunity. It says in verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise. It should just kind of be not... We're, we sometimes think education happens in the classroom. And once it's out of the classroom, you're done. No, look for opportunities. Now, I realize that some real eager beaver type uh, homeschool parents, yeah, 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 and they're just like foaming at the mouth ready to teach. And sometimes they take this and then, yeah, I, every moment, every second, and every of every day I'm just going to be cramming information into my kids. And that can be pretty stifling. You have to know your children. You have to know not to just be making them drink out of a fire hose. That's no fun. You drink out of a drinking fountain, not a fire hose. Fire hoses would beat your face to bits. Okay? And some people are so eager about education that they pound their kids to death with it. We don't want to do that, but we do want to seek opportunities to teach it in a way that's appealing to the children. Now this is again, the context is the law of God, not necessarily science, but be thinking about how, how to apply these principles. So, lifelong, Diligently, number, lifelong, number one. Diligently, number two. Why should we teach the law of God? Verse one. And this is the big one. This is the big one because it's... There's lots of reasons. But the biggest one is because he commanded it. Okay? He is the maker of heaven and earth. And when he says, teach the law, well... He doesn't really have to have reasons. <laughs> okay? He's God. He commanded it. Verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. There we have it. He commanded it. Secondly, verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God. He commanded it, and we 
are to be taught the law of God because we are to fear Him, not fear Him in a, only in a trembling sort of way. You can fear your parents, but we are to love our parents because they love us. There's a fear, but there's a healthy fear, and it's a fear that is a deep and abiding respect, but it's, it's a fear that's accompanied with love. Thirdly, that your days may be long. Let's look there at verse 2. It's a long verse. It says, that you, um, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. The first two reasons are, well, because God is God. And, okay. The third one is some positive feedback. There's good reasons why he wants us to be taught the law of God. That your days may be long, not that you just live long, but then fourthly, that it would go well with you. God loves us and he wants us to know that, not because he wants to just oppress us with his laws and so he's just this cosmic killjoy. No, he wants us to know his law so that we can live long and so that it may go well with us. We have to realize these things. And, fifth, that we may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. That's another automatic evangelism. Okay? When you just have kids, and they have kids, and they are taught to love God and obey Him, you just, yeast and a loaf. Um, culture's taken over. Okay, we should definitely evangelize, but just within our midst, within our homes, we want kids to grow up to love what we love. And those are things that often, we know that, we want that, but we often do the very opposite thing that will make them love what we love. Listen to that again. We want that to happen. We don't want our kids to tube out and go apostate and turn away from the Lord. But we often live our lives in such a sh shrill, overbearing way. You know, we're Christians. And you're, you know, you better do this because God told you to obey me. And, and all of the love and the joy that God wants to us to bestow on our children is not there. Okay? And the very thing that we want, we are working against often. And we, we don't want that to happen. If you're not doing that, wonderful. But check yourself and say, am I so eager for this that I'm just killing, you know, working against what I really want? So, we should, as I said before, we should obey above we should obey the above, this passage of Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, regardless of whether we teach anything else. Now, I'm not suggesting that we just teach Bible only. I think we should have a full orb, you know, because the world is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, He is the Lord of <coughs> biology. He created everything. He created the laws of chemistry and physics and uh, astronomy. So we should want to know our world, because God made it. But remember, the law of God, of, of loving Him and keeping His commandments, that's the main curriculum. Everything else, in one sense, is extracurricular. Science. Biology. What do you mean, biology is extracurricular? Compared to the law of God, it's extracurricular. Okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, so how should we take those principles, you know, and apply them to these other subjects? Well, number one, lifelong learning. Don't just think it's just for now, okay? Teach it in a way that can, and not that you're going to call your kids 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Have you worked, did you, have you reviewed your algebra? Uh, no. Mom, I've got three kids. I'm not talking about that. But you want to teach in such a way that they love to learn. 
If they hate, if they start hating learning, something's going wrong. Okay? If they hate your standards, then maybe your standards are too high. Or there's something about how you're teaching it that is just causing them to shrivel. Lifelong learning. And I do this a bit in my, I only have my, my students at New St. Andrews for a year, and then if they want to come back for more, they can have some electives from me. But I say, listen, the biology is, um, I don't want to, just to stop here. Yes, you got your little bit of biology from Dr. Wilson, and, and then I graduate and never to see it again. I tell them, even if you're not going to be a biologist, if you like what you've learned here, and you've learned to see God's creation in a little different way now, and you're appreciating it more, and you see birds and reptiles and, and butterflies and, and grass and flowers, and you see them in a different light, don't just let it fade away. Pick one of those groups as a layperson. Say, I'm not a biologist, but I really like birds. Will likes birds. He even mentioned the bald eagle. And uh, I haven't seen any salamanders yet this year, and I mentioned those if I could see one. But you, if, if pick a subject. If you like wildflowers, then go after wildflowers. Get the field guides for it. Get the field guides for whatever winds your clock, or whatever. If it's if it's some other discipline, if it's uh, stars, then get your telescope. And get you know encourage a particular um, hobby. That, that you taught, you know, when I taught I, biology, I want my students to run with one of those things. And if they don't, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not binding their conscience, but I want them to, uh, and, and I have students coming back to me. One kid had marine biology from me. He's worked, now he's up higher level in Wells Fargo. And because he took marine biology, he got certified in scuba, and now he's, scuba instructor and he's diving all over the place and you know I'm not even scuba certified but one of my students is and he's just diving everywhere and thinking this is great you know underwater stuff I'm like that's 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 lifelong learning okay he's not going to ever take a marine biology exam again but it's lifelong learning it's not just in the classroom either. Sometimes we think, okay, I'm just teaching the subject in here with my little drawing with race board or chalkboard, and that's where it stops. But you want to take the opportunity. Um, being a biologist is really, really easy. The classroom is everything outdoors. And so if I'm hiking with my family, let's look at stuff. Let's look at this flower. And I'm teaching my kids these things, you know, dragonflies, damselflies, um, lizards, the difference between lizards and salamanders. And, and it's not, it doesn't even feel like learning. Because it's natural, it's organic, it's, oh, by the way, here, here, here. And you can do that with math, you can do that with whatever. And you can think of the things, the subjects you like, you can think of how you connect that with real world things. Because I say when I draw a cell on the chalkboard, whiteboard, I say this isn't a cell. This is just a stupid model of a cell. The cells are what you're made out of, what this plant's made out of. If I draw an insect board, that's not an insect. That's just a rough, crude model of it. The insects are outside. The biology's outside. So make it, you know, I remember my daughter when she was with her aunt up on Tomer Butte, and uh, she was four. four. Four, you know, and her aunt is with her, and, and uh, my, my sister said, um, oh, Brooke, look at the dragonfly. And Brooke, my four-year-old, says, no, Aunt Heather, that's a damselfly. It has a blue abdomen. <laughs> okay, that's, that's out of the classroom kind of stuff. It's inculcated. And here it relates, uh, so it's not just in the classroom, and that relates to the passage above at every opportunity, sitting, when you sit in the house, walking, lying down, rising, you're looking for opportunities not to oppress, 
Oh, Mom. Oh, Dad. You know. I'm not again. Okay, if you get that, then you have to know when your cell job is getting a little too over the top. Okay? You have to know your customer. Okay? You have to know your customer. Give reasons for learning whatever it is you're teaching. Some people say, well, this is what you're supposed to know. You're not supposed to know algebra. Now, kids get to a certain age and they go, why? Why do I have to know? I did that in high school. It's like, Dad, I'm going to be a biologist. Why do I have to take algebra 2? Unfortunately, I won that argument. And... I took only Algebra 1, and that was really stupid. Because in college, uh, they, my advisor stuck me in college algebra, and then I went blah, 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 had to drop, and had to go take beginning algebra because I didn't take Algebra 2 in high school. So give, um, I thought, well, I'm a biologist. I don't need to know this, this math. Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, you do. Give reasons for it. And if you don't know the reasons for it, find them. Now, ultimately, like it says at the beginning, you're supposed to uh, learn and teach the law of God because He's God. He commanded it. And you could resort to that power play. Well, you need to know algebra because I said so. <laughs> okay, you can do that. But when the kids get to a certain age, they kind of want to know why. And if you don't know why, then maybe you should know why. Okay? Because it gives them some a little more incentive, a little more motivation. Yes, we're doing it because mom and dad said so, but also there's good reasons for it. They're, they're teaching me these stuff, these things because it's gonna be beneficial. It's gonna help me out. It's gonna really open up my world. I'm not going to be scratching my head when I'm trying to figure out which is more per ounce at the grocery store. Okay? Give reasons for whatever it is you're learning. What are the benefits? It may be, it's going to equip you for your profession, but like with New St. Andrews students, they're not really going to be biologists, so what am I doing? Um, there, I want them to learn to appreciate the creation whatever they're going to do as a profession. And maybe I can work it into an avocation. Okay? But even if you never touch it again, even if you never touch that subject again, if you teach it well and rigorously, there's just benefits from the discipline period. Okay? When you're working your head in algebra or whatever, Whatever a class it is, and it's it's hard, but you're working it. It's kind of like drills in some athletic thing. It, the coach is making you run suicides. You say, "Why are we doing this?" Well, to get in shape. Okay. And a lot of subjects, even if you never touch.